Okay, folks, uh, welcome to another Tuesday night lecture at the, the Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club online Zoom. Um, if you haven't joined us before, you're very welcome. And uh, these Zooms are run by the Mid-Ulster Amateur Radio Club in uh, Porterdown in Northern Ireland. So uh, you're very welcome indeed. We have a few stations from... Uh, England, and uh, I'm not sure if we'll be joined this evening, but anyone may have noticed last week and the week before, we had a station from Norway join us for two weeks in a row, so that was very good. I thought we'd kick off this evening there, uh, just as we're uh, killing a bit of time, just explaining how the uh, Tuesday night lecture series uh, came about. So if you don't know, myself, I'm Dave, 2i0sjv, and i uh, I am the exam secretary for the, the Mid Ulster Amateur Club at the moment, and uh, people would say I was a brainchild behind it, but definitely not, definitely not. Um, on the team we have uh, Georgia GI four SJQ. Uh, feel free, George, if you want to say hello there, uh, do a wee bit of an introduction. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh... Dave's uh, sidekick in the foundation exam training. He, he forgot to mention that. Uh, the two of us would normally cover the exam, uh, the foundation training and intermediate together along with uh, a couple of other colleagues in the club. And um, yeah. Uh, the, and how these ideas usually go is, George, I've had an idea. <laughs> and guess who's helping me, George? <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> when? <laughs> So, uh, yes, myself and George run uh, the foundation and uh, intermediate training with a few others in the club there. Uh, we have also Jamie, who can't make it this evening, Jamie, MI7FAC, uh, and he is uh, what I would call the video wizard behind all this. So he takes all this rough footage that we get each Tuesday night and edits it and cuts it all together and uh, uploads it onto our YouTube channel. And uh, I'm telling you how he does it, I do not know, but uh, he's able to run uh, wonders every week and uh, adds a bit of blusher to my face and everything else along with it. And a uh, wee bit of, what is it, that software? Photoshop Pro, that's the one. Photoshop, a wee bit of Photoshop onto me there. Uh, no, before uh, before we upload, and he uh, do, does great work there behind the scenes. So he was a recent foundation uh, uh, candidate of ours, uh, George, wasn't he? And uh, he decided to help. Uh, and then we have uh, last, but certainly not least, <laughs> uh, Philip, MI0MSO. Philip, tell us, for those who haven't joined us before or know us, who are you? And uh, what is it you do? Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm the regional rep, RSGB regional rep for Region 8, which is Northern Ireland. Dave is one of my deputies. I uh, see John there too. John's another deputy. Or, well, they're not called deputies now, they're called district reps. But Dave says, tell, tell us what you do. I do what Dave tells me to do, basically. <laughs> uh, it gets me involved in a lot of wee things and projects that the Mid Ulster do. I have to say, no offence to anybody who's a member of any other club in Region 8, Mid, Mid Ulster are very proactive. Come up with some great ideas. Sometimes they don't always come to fruition because it's hard to get places at times. And, and what will everybody be involved here, either in the society or the clubs? does take a while to get things sorted of things. So he just asked me to help co-host these Tuesday night lectures, basically, uh, because I have, like George, I come from an IT background. Several years ago, I would have done a lot of multimedia, but I'm by no means uh, a fave of all the recent technologies like Jimmy would be. And I do believe Jimmy does a lot of it on his phone, too. Yeah. He, you know, he's traveling on that. Is it Jimmy travels on the train or is it somebody else? He does indeed. Yeah, uh, Jimmy yeah, travels on, on the train. You usually see him with the, the face mask on, the, the TransLink mobile. He, he mentioned uh, that uh, 
Jimmy's quite good at the Photoshop and whatnot. It's thanks to Jimmy that I am sitting with this virtual background at the minute. Uh, and also thanks to George. He done a wee one, quick one for me the night for, for Raynet. I could, could do these myself, but Jimmy can do them in about two minutes, you know, and does a very, very good job. So good job to know. So I'm here because Dave asked me to help co-host, plus some, there have been some great lectures. I think it's great on this stuff that Matt Ulster have started. And though Steve Thomas, when he done the talk, we sort of denied it. The RSGB store idea started the Tuesday night lecture show, or the Monday uh, Monday at night eight or tonight at eight or whatever. No, they didn't. They had some plan, but we we got off the air a lot quicker. But it's it's uh, it's great, and the series is going to continue, Dave, for quite a while longer. We do have quite a few other speakers. Yes, yes. Mind so, me? sorry, Philip, I cut you off there. Go ahead. Or, yeah, I say you do have a lot more speakers. I think Dave really pulled me in because I do have some contacts and I suggested some speakers. And uh, Absolutely. It's not as... and the great, great thing about this virtual thing is you'll get a speaker or somebody to give you a presentation. There's Mr. Wilson now. You'll get somebody to give you a presentation and do a Q&A a lot easier over virtual than you could do yeah. in, the, in the air club. You know, and there's no real expenses. Well, though you would always pay so many expenses if you had to. But Philip, but I remember, I remember now when I started off at the the district grab, you always used to tell me, "It's not what you know is important to clubs; it's who you know." And that's why you're here that's because right. you've got the contacts. You know, <laughs> I've always told you, Dave, and I've always told everybody else, it's about networking and making contacts, and then making contacts through them contacts. And Mr. Wilson can verify what I'm about to say. When I'm over at volunteer leadership team meetings and regional meetings and other events in the UK, I never shut up about the Mad Ulster Amateur Radio Club. <laughs> Is that true or not, Dave? You just never shut up. That's you know, I will, Yes, I just never shut up. But yes, I do, I do mention the clubs here and whatnot. Because when I first no, that's, started no, that's volunteering as an RSGB rep, was regional manager at that stage, must be nine, nine years easily now or so. I used to hear, and I really, I'm going to use a word that people might not like, pissed me off, that nothing happens in Northern Ireland. Nobody's active in Northern Ireland. Well, I changed that perception over the last lack of years, and I continue to do. But thank God that Dave's joined us, because trying to fall on the waffle is not, a, not easy at things. Well, so well, Dave, well. back to you. He, he, he joined a bit early there because I was just about to do a big blurb there when uh, he, he came on to uh, the wee waiting room there. Uh, you were saying, Philip, we've got a few lined up. Indeed, we do. And I want to give you folks a, a rundown first because you, these are the guys, have all joined every week before uh, we do some PR. So uh, next week, Victor Mitchell, The History and Appreciation of Morse. Uh, which he goes actually more into not just about Morse and how you do it, but the history and everything else and the value of Morse and where it comes from. Can you meet, uh, Dave, can you meet Mr. Wilson's speakers? Because he might pick up some ideas and give it to the RSTB for the <laughs> <idea for lectures. laughs> Um On the 11th, uh, we have... Um, a representative from the IRTS join us. who's going to be doing a presentation. On the 18th, uh, we have uh, the BBC uh, newsreader who first uh, made contact with the Falkland Islands, uh, Laurie Margoli. I think I remember off the top of his head, uh, off the top of my head, uh, his name. So he's on the 18th of August. The 25th, we have uh, our good friend there, George, and he's going to be doing a, a lecture on the contesting 101 and setting up of the N1MM software, login software. So that's our rundown for August as it stands at the moment. Uh, they will appear on our website, www.muarc.com, and uh, feel free as well to have a look on there. And also, if you don't follow our YouTube channel, please do go on and like and subscribe our YouTube channel. You would help us out a whole lot. If you go to youtube.com and 
just search for M-U-A-R-C and click the subscribe button. That would be great. So, without further ado, uh, that is enough waffle from me. Dave, how we doing? I'm all right, thanks. (laughs) 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 There's too many Daves around, apologies. (laughs) Sorry, yes. Dave, (laughs) Dave Wilson, how we doing? (laughs) (laughs) Mr. Wilson, I have to declare an interest before, in case somebody asks you later on, is it true? At the lecture of the night that me and Steve on the I done the wee presentation, me and Steve done a Q and A on one of my slides. There was an Easter egg. Cambridge what an Easter egg! egg. <laughs> About val- validate, 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 That's and it right. did yes. tell people. It mightn't have been one hundred percent accurate, but it did tell people that you disappeared with about a third of the box. That's right. <laughs> was it me or was it Sandra? I, well, I, I think you have. A, I think you have a sweet tooth when it comes oh, to. Oh, I do. I do. I definitely. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Sandra Dean and Kath all send their best regards to everybody. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Great. We, uh, great. We, we uh, fondly remember that uh, that afternoon or that evening in in the shack there. It was really. Yeah, good absolutely. Good. Yeah. Really. So, Dave, who tell us little, who was the little lad. Who was the little lad who kept saying, "Mr. President, Dave, Mr. President"? Young William, that would have been probably. Young William, was it? Yeah, oh, dear. Yes. Young, nice lad. Yeah. Dave, tell us who are you? What's your call sign? And what do you do? Me, me. I'm a radio amateur. All right. My call sign is Mike Zero, Oscar Bravo Whiskey. Old Bald Wilson, if you want some other phonetics. <laughs> and there is another one, <laughs> but I won't tell it you on here, <laughs> which Kath has got. Uh, dear me. Um, and, well, what, what, do you, <laughs> what do I do? Well, I do all sorts. You know, who am I? Well, I'm president of the RSGB, quality manager for the RSGB. Like you, Dave, I'm a district DR for the RSGB. I work for my boss downstairs. You know, so I know when to jump and I know how high to jump. You know, so, um, and be, I've been licensed since uh, 91, 92. So been around a while, but, uh, you know, to, a, a relative youngster to a lot of people. So, so came to the hobby light. How did you get involved in amateur radio for a start? What made you think about doing a license? R- oh, well. That was that was a long story. Not a long story. It started off listening to air band, right? Because we're not a million miles away from Manchester Airport, and um, for some reason, and I can't remember why, but I bought a, a little um, shortwave receiver, and we listened on that for a while, and then I got a VHF receiver and listened to Manchester Airport, and spent. A lot of time, we used to go, Kath and I used to go in the evenings, we used to nip up to Manchester Airport and watch the planes and listen to them and all sorts of things. And Kath actually fell in love with one of the pilots. She never met him, but she really fancied him. Right? And he was uh, the pilot of, uh, the, the, the course, the flight number was Swiss Air 842. He used to come in from Zurich every night. I think it still does, but I don't think it's the same pilot. So that's how we got into radio in the first place. I then bought a scanner and uh, started listening around and found the amateur bands. And for a long time, we used to sit and listen to Moyley Park, GB3MP, um, which, again, isn't a million miles away from here, uh, a bit west, um, just over the border in Wales. And we realised then that amateur radio was fun because there was a couple of old guys on there. Right? One was in mould not far from the repeater, and one was up in Wigan or, you know, somewhere around about the Wigan area. And they were real wind-up merchants. They were brilliant. You know, they used to throw bits of things into the conversations. Um, And the one that really sticks in my mind is that we're talking one one evening about uh, how to make cauliflower cheese, right? This, you know, the guy in Mould knew the best way because his wife, who was in a, a nursing home just around the corner, she said, you know, this is the best way to make it. And the guy in Wigan said, no, no, this is the way you do it. Then somebody came in from the side and says, no, that's a load of rubbish and all the rest of it. And, you know, more and more joined in. And, every, and these two guys just sort of 
left left the conversation and just let it all go on around her. It was really comical to listen to. And we had lots of fun listening to people. One day we decided he got a copy of Pracky Wireless and in there noticed that it was the Land No Rally. So we decided to drive along to the Land No Rally. We'd been listening to amateurs for a while and one of them was uh, Billy Daly. G7JCQ was his call sign. And uh, he was a taxi driver in Liverpool. And it's the usual thing. I don't know how many, you've probably all done it. You've heard, you've listened to somebody on the radio and you've built up this mental picture of them, haven't you? Right. And then when you meet them, you go looking for them and you think, oh, that's not him. Well, Billy was exactly one of those. He was as hard as nails, you know, listening to him on the radio, taxi driver in Liverpool. You've got to be, have your wits about you, remember. Yeah. Well, you know, he, uh, there's some tales about, you know, some people coming into the cab, you know, with no money and then wanting to uh, offer favour, grace and favours, you know, instead of payment and that sort of thing. And people running away and all the rest. And so we built up this picture of Billy. And he was, in my mind, he was about six foot three, really broad, stocky, a big head of hair. Right? So we went along to the radio rally at Van Dundo and we're walking around there and we heard this voice, the Billy's voice. I said to Kath, listen. And there's, there was Billy's voice. And I started looking for somebody up there. He wasn't up there. He was down here. <laughs> he was about five foot. <laughs> five foot two, maybe. Give him, give him benefit. But he was six foot, but he was round. Instead of tall, it was round. Uh, little fat guy. <laughs> and he had a sort of close cropped hair. Didn't have a big head of hair. But he was a really, you know, he still is. He's, he's a really lovely guy. And he's the guy that actually got us into amateur radio because he said, why don't you come along to the radio club? And again, that's another story because we went along. He says, he says, come along. He says, come along on next Saturday, next Sunday. We've got a fox hunt, mobile fox hunt. All right, what's that? Well, using an aerial, you know, and a, and a radio, you have to try and find out where the transmitter is. Oh, sounds a bit of fun. So, yeah. So Kath and I jumped in the car on Sunday morning made a way up there, borrowed an HB9 CV. We'd got the scanner and then we were given this map and this station was on this map somewhere and you had to find it. Well, we drove about 200 miles looking for this bloody station. <laughs> I used half a tank of fuel trying to find it. Right, the, the, and it's the usual thing, isn't it? The, in the envelope, there's usually an envelope and says, don't open this until you're completely lost. And that was the name of the pub we were going to. <laughs> So, oh dear. But, and then from there, met the rest of the club and then started going to the classes, the, the evening classes on a Friday night. Uh, and the rest is history, but we'll go through We'll go through that, Dave. So you've been licensed for a while, then, I suppose, since the early or mid-90s. Has there anything really in your time as an amateur or stations, what have you, that you've worked that have really stuck in your head that you still think of, you went, Flip, that was amazing. You know, I, that was a particular station or call sign or event or something that you were involved in that really actually got the blood pumping type of thing. <laughs> in what way? You mean aggressive or? <laughs> well, <laughs> we all we all have highs and lows, Dave. Yeah. You know, I've never been a you know a mad keen operator as such. I mean, yeah, we've we've had um, you know um, we, we've done contesting and stuff like that. We used to take part. The club used to take part in the uh, in the um, UKAC contest, and that was a bit of a buzz, and that was great because we were we were in the top three for a while. It was that was really good. But I've never been a big operator. I've been more more of a doer than than an operator. Not a constructor, you know, but just get involved in, you know, the, the admin side. And what, what I get a buzz out of is meeting people, you know, because, you know, we've got, got hundreds and hundreds of friends, if you want to call them that, you know, people that we know in the, out of this hobby. And it's amazing, you know, the friendliness that this hobby uh, offers to people. You know. And on, under these situations that we've got now with lockdown and all the rest of it, I mean, amateurs are helping amateurs, you know? And that's, Very that's much really so, fantastic. very much so. Yeah, so. 
But no, so, I mean, the, the, the greatest thing that, you know, <laughs> it's a bit sort of naff in some respect, but, you know, um, the greatest pleasure for me was actually being made president of the RSGB, you know. Uh, that, that was a real honour, you know. I, I was just going to say, I was going to come to that, Dave, how on earth did you come up with the idea of, I think I'll run for president. You know, was it one <laughs> one morning over breakfast or something, or was it a nudge from Kath to say, you know, here you could do this? How how did that come about? You know, or did yeah. you become a DR first and then think of, or yeah, what 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 happened there? Well, going going right back, I mean, there was a reorganisation many years ago. There's lots of reorganisations within the RSGB, remember? Um, and I forget when this exactly was. Um, I mean, first of all, go back a little bit further. I got involved with the repeater management committee because I've always been involved with the repeaters uh, and I'm actually the NOV holder for a couple of three repeaters. Um, but somebody said there's a vacancy on the, on the repeater management committee. Why don't you go and go for it and represent the North of England? So I did and, and got on it and you know, that was, that was good fun. Um, but hard work and it was good to go around and meet people and things like that. So I'd been doing some work with the RSGB for a little while. Then um, the president of the RSGB, a guy called Peter Shepherd, got in touch with Kath. I mean, everybody knows Kath, you know. <laughs> but uh, Peter uh, uh, reorganised the regions, and Peter wanted Kath to be the regional manager for the northwest of England. And so he you know, persuaded her uh, to take on the role. And because of that, as we are now, she needed deputies. And so she enrolled me as a deputy along as well. So I say, I work for the boss. You know, she was the boss there. She then went on to the board representing the, the regional team. And then there was a board vacancy and somebody said, well, why don't you go for that? So I went for it and, and got duly elected. And then it was coming up to, when would it be? It was about November time. There was a board meeting. And a couple of people had a word with me and said, you know, if we put you forward, would you be prepared to, to go for, for president? And at that time, there was actually two of us, but it was done via the board. It wasn't a, um, an election you know, of the membership. It was done from the board. Um, and so two of us sort of you know, um, did our pitch. Uh, and, and I was, uh, I, I was you know, duly voted in as the, as the president. And, that to me was was gobsmacking because who would have thought that me, <laughs> you know, only being in the hobby five minutes, so to speak, you know, uh, this was back in two thousand and ten, um, you know, would, would would get to that position, and uh, well, you know, it still amazes me. You touched uh, a bit briefly there, Dave. You're saying you're involved in uh, or got involved originally in repeaters. What sort of repeaters are you in NOV, or how are you involved in those, or what what type of repeaters are they even? <laughs> well, I'm now chairman. I'm chairman of the UK FM Group Western, which is the biggest UK, the biggest repeater group in the UK. We've got 17 repeaters under our banner, under our wing. Okay, so, <laughs> um, but along the lines, when I've been involved with GB3 MP. Um, that's had a, a checkered history for many, many years. It was infamous for uh, abusers, IQ zeros and the like. Um, and people, it was, it was a kiss of death. You know, to, to hold the NOV for, for MP you know, was, was, was like a kiss of death for, for a lot of people. And, you know, the, um, Dave, uh, who held it for a while, decided he wanted to give it up and asked me if I'd take it on, you know. And this was the time when things were really bad. So I took it on. And then we started negotiations with the IRA, as it was then, um, as to what we could do to, you know, to, to um, you know, get, get it back to some normality. Well, the first thing that the IRA did was uh, told us to turn it down to one watt right? <laughs> and th put a 30 dB attenuator in the receive. Well, that made it really good, you know. So there was only the sheep underneath the mast who could actually use it, you know. Um, so that went on for a while. And we slowly got people, you know, uh, started working with people and got them better trained, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and we kept nudging the RA, saying, you know, 
well, can we have a little bit? You know, can, he, can we try something? We, we wanted to put remote control on there, right? We'd got a system of remote control, and they wouldn't let us do it. Right. Which which was ahead of its time then, I suppose. Yes, exactly. Yeah, not not my not I I wasn't the guy behind it. That was one. That's our um, technical expert, Peter G eight NSS. You see, I I always salute G eight because those are the ones that know about radio. They know what goes on in the inside, you know, and they could build them. They could take them apart and do anything. So, but now we 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 pestered the RA, and in the end, we built up a relationship with them. And as I keep saying all along the line, life revolves around relationships. Yeah. Like, like uh, Philip was saying before, you know, it's not what you know, it's who you know. It's exactly that. I totally agree. So, so we, we built up this relationship with, uh, with the RA, with a local guy who was based in Anglesey, and then the, uh, the manager who was in South Wales. And he came up and we... We, he was doing a club talk, and um, I won't mention the club, but you know, when he finished the talk, they just said, you know, bye, thank you, safe journey home, and didn't, do, didn't think about offering him any hospitality or anything. So there was a few of I'm afraid you're not going to get any hospitality here either, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> so, but... Uh, but we there was a few of us from the repeat, about three or four of us from the repeater group, and we we sort of latched onto him and took him for a drink and you know plied him with a few beers and all the rest of it and built that relationship up. And within six months, they were starting to give us a bit more power, a bit less attenuation. And in the end, we got it back. But the one thing we didn't do was tell anybody. Actually, let it happen, right? You know, if you make a big announcement about something like that, and the idiots are going to be there, aren't they? So we just tipped it up, you know, nick, tickled it up every time as we could, and just never said anything. And then, about eighteen months down the line, we said, "Well, has anybody noticed?" And then they all went, "Oh yeah, <laughs> never realised." <laughs> but they were much more disciplined then. So, so you're a two-term president. Uh, yeah, obviously yeah. you were the RSV president uh, once, and then 2010 to 2013. Yeah, and then a bit of a gap, and then you got elected again. Yeah, for another three years. For another three years, yes. Yeah. Well, bear in mind, it's only supposed to be two. It's only supposed to be two years, is it? Yes. No. <laughs> See, you know, you don't want on it. when you have something good, you don't want to let it go. <laughs> we have a saying over here you can't put a good heifer down Dave you know <laughs> hang on hang on I'll, give us your address I'll send you the five pounds <laughs> that um, sounds great thanks guys <laughs> <laughs> so two term president has that motivated you sort of being a president that you've went oh you know the stuff I still want to achieve I'll do it again or or what made you do become president or go for it the second time round? <laughs> Arm up the back. <laughs> Simple as that. There was a VLT meeting um, in Jury's Inn at uh, Nottingham. I'm not Sorry, guilty. In, uh, you. In I'm not guilty. <laughs> <laughs> and I got, uh, you know, a number of people approaching me saying, you know, will you stand, will you stand, will you stand? And so we couldn't do anything else, could I? In all honesty, yeah. Yeah. very good, very good indeed. Yeah. And what actually does a president do? You know, yes, it's ceremonial and everything else. But what does a president actually do apart from Q? Uh, what are, what is it? Uh, what, apart from being the, the compare at the conference dinner <laughs> each uh, on the Saturday the night, convention. you know. <laughs> RSGB convention, you present the awards, yeah. Um, at the AGM, you present the awards. You give a rundown of the, of the happenings of, at the AGM as well in the year, yeah. So, yeah. But, uh, no, I mean, it's, it's really just a catalyst, you know, be, being there to, you know, to take ideas forward and working together with the chairman of the board, you know. I mean, originally, when I, when, when I was a president first time round, it was chairman. It was president and chairman of the board, but we realised the way things went that that it was too much for one person, mm. right? and so as part way through 
my tenure as president the first time, um, we, we rejigged the whole thing. We brought in an interim board and brought in, you know, a chairman, the chairman of the board. It was a separate role, a separate individual. Uh, and as you say, the president role is more ceremonial and more sort of guidance and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the I wouldn't, <laughs> Ian Shepard, I hope he's not listening. He might be on here, you never know, you know, but uh, he's got the hard job. I've got the easy job, right? <laughs> but he does a great job, you know, under, under you know, difficult circumstances. The, the, I, maybe I'm wrong, Dave, but you do attend a lot of sort of important meetings too. Oh, yes. With yeah. the likes of Ofcom and Ofcom, other Eddie's yeah. and... IIU you've been, and over, like you've been over to the IRTS and yeah yeah. Like got, yeah yeah you helped set up the new online exam system with uh test reach isn't it test reach? yeah but 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 that's not the president's role that was just an area that I'm particularly interested in yeah but might, hard. Because, because bear in mind I wasn't the president then because <laughs> that because that was that was when I was the EQAM and again it was working with um Ian you know teamwork um, Ian was the standards manager. I was the quality manager, and Ian had been approached to to look at you know, an online exam system and had gone away and done the donkey work. So he gets all the hard jobs, right? um, and then you know he came and then we he presented it to the board or test reach came and presented to the board, and uh, you know it was, since then it's that's history. Then since then, you know. And can uh, you explain that, a bit? That, I mean that was. Sorry, the difference between exams before you got involved and not obviously don't want to be putting anyone else down, you know. But have you seen a, have you seen a big difference in the exams and how they've been run? Obviously, the main one being the introduction of test reach and now the online exams. But how have they changed since you got involved as the exams quality to now? Maybe you can talk a wee bit about that. And where is it going in the yeah. future? What, you know, where do you <laughs> see exams going in the future? <laughs> That's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> oh dear. Um, what was it like? Well, well, say I was enrolled as the. I took on the role of uh, quality manager. Uh, quality and again, again, it was two jobs rolled into one at that time. Right. Um, the previous quality manager and quality and standards manager. Um, for various reasons, decided you know to, to step down, and I offered to to take the place on a temporary basis, um, uh, doing what I could. And essentially, then it was making sure that the documentation was correct with regard to challenges and appeals and conduct of the exams and all the paperwork around that. Um, and then, uh, so a lot of it was uh, trying to um, do. Uh, what we're looking to do was to do about 10% un unannounced inspections because, you know, an amateur license is a valuable piece of real estate, you know, it shouldn't be, t shouldn't be taken lightly. Um, so things have to be done properly. And, you know, we're, we, it's sad, but, you know, in life, not everybody abides by the rules. I mean, I've broken the 30 mile an hour only occasionally, you know, and occasionally the 40 one. You know. <laughs> You know, we all do it, but sometimes it's a bit more serious than others. And some people were, were uh, you know, abusing the system. And so it was the quality manager's job, along with the team of re the regional reps, the regional managers and the DRs, to try and uh, make sure it was being done properly. But because of the way we, we run the exams, it's quite difficult because we're only given short notice that people are going to be running the exam. We only have to give 10 days notice. And if you wanted to, if I wanted you to go and do an exec, to go and do an unannounced inspection, I don't know about it until the, possibly 10 days beforehand, right? I then get in touch with you, say, can you do an inspection, you know, in eight days' time? And you say, no, sorry, I can't because I'm working. Then somebody, you, you see somebody else. Before you know it, too many people know about it. So you think, this isn't going to be worth a, a carrot anyway. So, so that, that, was, that was the role. But then, um, like all positions in the RSGB, they're up for you know, ratification and they, they need to be you know, properly advertised and things like that. So it was decided to advertise for the position of quality manager, quality and standards manager. 
So I applied for it. At the same time, and I don't know whether, how many did, but Ian Shepherd applied for it as well. And I did, I'd seen Ian around, but I didn't know Ian. I'd seen him at the at rallies and things occasionally, but didn't know him. And in the end, what they decided to do was to split the role. <laughs> so Ian got the standards, because that's, that's his expertise, that's his area of expertise. And I got the quality, because I'm just rough. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, and again, we worked very closely together, you know, and we, we brought a lot of the things that were lacking, we brought them into line as a, as a team and, and, you know, and that's what it's all about, you know. And then, you know, Ian then decided to stand for board and then he became the director of the board and stood down from the standards. So, but sure. I've carried on and I've kept it while I've been doing all the other things, like as I say, quality manager, DR and all the rest of it. So you've still some time in your week to add a few other things in there then as well, on top of what you already do. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, no. Because <laughs> I used to, up until, what would it be, four years ago, maybe it's five years ago now, I forget when I actually retired. You know, it's got to be about four years ago. Uh, I was working. But I was a I used to be that real. <laughs> That's right, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so, Stan. I was very fortunate that that I I was a department of one. It ended <laughs> up as one. <laughs> is, is there a bit of a theme you know, here? <laughs> yeah. Stan, um, on, Steve, Stan on the topic of exams. Yeah, we introduced test reach. We've introduced now the online invigilation for the exams with the lockdown. Can you give us some facts and figures? What has been the difference before lockdown till now? How many <laughs> how many candidates have we had go through? Right. What does that look like? Hang on, I've just got to give me crib sheets on the other screen. Absolutely, work away. <laughs> I've got some of them up here. So this is a, um, a sheet that I keep. I, I'm not going to show you, but this is what I'm looking at is uh, a sheet that... Um, tells me the, the, the number of exams that were done last year, 2019, for instance, right? To start with. At foundation level, in 2019, we held 1,741 exams. Okay? That was, that was the whole of 2019. Which, which is a good innings for a national good, society. Yeah. 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 Okay, right. First quarter of this year, before lockdown, 406 foundation candidates. Not bad. So Four we're, we're, we're on target. Is, we're on target oh, for roughly the same figure. Right. Yeah, yeah. The second quarter, sitting down, <laughs> 1,005 foundation candidates. That's, you know, twice as much, two and a half times as much. The third quarter, we've got 941. Bear in mind, that's up until the end of September, and there's still slots available in September. So you can see, you know, what we've done. We've done, what's that, 14? That's so about nine, about 900 two, extra so far two, without... Two, yes, exactly. And we and only have quarter. through the year. Yeah. So it's really taken off. Where do you think that is, Dave? Unpent up, oh, um, sorry, pent up demand, right? This might get a bit awkward now um, because what we've noticed is that, you know, um, we've all, you know, your club, our club, lots of clubs are running training courses. But I don't know whether you noticed, but our numbers of people attending the courses were beginning to drop off a little bit, okay? Because, you know, it wasn't always practical for them to... I mean, we, we do our courses at weekends. We don't do them on club nights. Right? So it wasn't practical for people to come along and, and uh, devote a whole weekend to a foundation course, for instance. There were truck drivers who might not be around, shift workers, families, and all the rest of it. Um, so, you know, whilst we were getting decent numbers overall... There was still a lot of people out there, as it turns out, my, my view anyway, turns out there was a lot of people who wanted to do it but couldn't get there. 
Sure. Right? Yeah. Lockdown and all the rest of it forced people to sit in one place for an extremely long period of time. What can I do? Well, hundreds and hundreds of people that I've spoken to, and probably you when you've been doing the calls, you know, they say, well, I wish I'd have done this years ago. I wanted to do it years ago. Right? But now this is the opportunity. So there's a pent-up uh, opportunity there. The distance from radio clubs um, can be a problem as well. You know, coming from work in an evening, you know, you don't want to travel 30 miles to the nearest radio club. You know, yeah, you might do five miles to six miles, but 30 miles is a long way, depending on the terrain and all the rest of it. You know, um, yeah. So we have... And then we the have... age profile... We have about 1,900 candidates since lockdown. How many invigilators do you have? And I guess that's a loaded question for those that don't know. <laughs> I'm also an online invigilator, but that's that's not why I'm getting here. How Does many it... how many online invigilators have you got? You can answer that one. You know. No, no. <laughs> I, I, asked, talk to you. no. I asked the questions to see. This is great <laughs> about being in the host seat. I asked the questions. I don't have to answer any, Dave. But, uh, now, there's, there's between 22 and 25 invigilators who are doing this work, guys, and they deserve a round of applause. They do, really. No, no, no. The ones that the next question are the ones that deserve the round of applause. So, yes, we've got X amount of candidates. We have 25, 26 invigilators. How many people are actually organizing the exams? <laughs> there's two people doing that well one really right Raya is full time on it and Carol helps her out yeah Raya is the Raya is the lady at headquarters who takes all these applications and processes them puts them into the system uh, into the, and unfortunately we've got two systems at the moment you know that we need to have but loads them all up and then you know um, turns the handle on it and makes it work one yeah. person organising all yeah. those exams, you know, or one and a half, Carol helps her out, yeah, but... Well, uh, you can imagine, right at the start of lockdown, it was chaos, right? Because back in, um, was it 10th of, 10th of March, 19th of March, I can't remember the exact day, but we announced that all the exams were going to have to stop because of social distancing and all the rest of it. So we weren't prepared to, to uh, you know, carry on with the exams. And then... We came up with the idea of, of how to do remote invigilation, and we tested it. I tested it with with the, the standards manager and the chairman of the standards committee, and proved that it would work because they tried to break it and couldn't. Right, and then we decided to make it public. Well, making it public was one thing, but what we slipped up with was we didn't. We, we'd underestimated again the demand. We didn't know how many people wanted to do it. And it was, whilst we got, you know, FAQs to guide people, Carol and Raya were getting hundreds of phone calls, hundreds of emails a day from people wanting to do the exams, right? And trying to track those was an absolute nightmare. Trying to work out where the opportunities were to take the exams, the slots, right? And then allocate somebody to it right, on a first come, first serve basis and track their payment. And again, the accounts department, the headquarters were involved in that part of it. And it was absolute nightmare. And, you know, we were, you know, they were going under. Literally, they were going home and there were still 100, 150 emails unanswered, which is not good at all, is it really? Crazy, yeah. So what we decided to do was we had to automate the system somehow. And so very quickly, we, we looked at a, a, an option, a possible way of doing it. Uh, and then Mark Alga, who's a commercial manager, found this little package that uh, he was quite used to. Uh, we tailored it to suit the book, the uh, exam system. And we introduced the bookings, the booking system that you now see on the web. And that is now, it's, vir it's virtually, all, it's automatic. It gets all the information from the candidate right their name their address their date of birth their email address their um, they decide they decide when they want to do the exam and they go to a calendar and if it's if it's highlighted then it's available if it's shaded out grayed out then you can't book it right so they pick a time that suits them 
click on it. Then they put their credit card details in and the whole thing is paid. And then what we do is we get a report every week that comes off the system and then we simply go through that and then you know, we manipulate it such that we can then put it into the exam systems. So that now is a very much more you know, uh, so, easy yeah, system. Easier system, great for the folks in the offices and everything else. Uh, and and the, for candidates. And yes, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. for the for the actual uh, candidates and hopefully future members of the RSEW. But how many candidates can you do a day or what's the maximum amount of candidates can be done in, a, in an actual exam session per invigilator we, type of thing? Yeah, when, when we started doing it, we were doing four a day, right? And there were six slots, right? Four a day. So that was 24 candidates per day. Bear in mind, we were doing them seven days a week. And we were, we were fully booked. There was no gaps, you know. Um, when we brought the booking system on, you know, we thought, hang on, this is, this is getting, you know, this is, this is crazy. You know? <laughs> it's not fair to, to, to you guys, you invigilators. So what we did is we backed it off to three, three candidates per time slot. So now there's 18 candidates a day. And that's been like that since we, uh, we introduced the booking system. But we can literally go in and, and flick it back to four, we could up it to five, but it means more invigilators and things like that, you know. So. Sure, sure. But, you know, what we need to be very careful of, and people are saying, well, we've, we've relatively uh, recently, we've introduced, we, we've announced that uh, intermediate's available. Um, you know, well, the first intermediate exams from the, after that announcement don't happen until about 10th of August because the, the, the program, the, the slots were full up until then, even though we'd made the announcement, they couldn't book them because there was no slots. But what we're going to make sure is that, you know, we, even though the systems are automatic, we've still got to make sure that we don't overload Raya and Carol again, because they were really under pressure, you know, and so we're being very cautious, you know, with things. Yeah, absolutely. And because it does come down to literally two people yeah. organizing the whole thing, yeah. Um, and, and you with and you as invigilators you know then we don't want to be saying well look there's six here today you know you've got to you've got to get there and you know invigilate them you know because it's taking your time your volunteers you know you know remember these guys <laughs> these guys everybody these guys do it for free absolutely <laughs> fantastic yeah that's what you think wait till we get to the convention next year you're gonna have a wee bill send up no i'm joking um so Dave, going back to the RSEB, we've had thousands of foundation candidates through uh, lockdown. Uh, we're going on to maybe double the amount of exams possibly by the end of the year. What does that look like for the RSEB? How many people are, have joined? Do you know how many people have joined out of the candidates that have passed so far? Yeah, it, it's roughly about 50%. Okay. Right? Um, uh, because it, it lags a bit, right? You know, people who took it one month don't join until the next month and that sort of thing, right? Um, but we, we reckon, you know, we reckon about 50% per month. But then on top of that, right, you've also got people who are coming back into the hobby. Yeah. That's the other thing that we've realised is that, that lockdown has, done, uh, has, has helped us, is that because people were um, you know, licensed previously because of work commitments, family commitments and all the rest of it. They didn't have the time to, uh, to devote to it. But now on lockdown and, and things like that, it's amazing how many people have, come join, have rejoined the hobby and rejoined the society. From a membership point of view, we're, our membership number is the highest it's been since 2011. Right? And it's still growing. Yeah, so we get about about three hundred a month. Great, yeah. great. Yeah. And long term, what does that look like with the society? I mean, does that give us a bit more clout when it comes to Ofcom? Look how many more members we're now <laughs> representing, or, um, that sort of thing. Or on the with regards to IARU, you know, where does the RSGB sit? In the table of, of yeah. national societies, 
Well, it's well respected, first of all. You know, you've got to remember that the society is one of the oldest in the world, you know, and, you know, it's very well respected. Um, does it give us more, you know, more, more clout? Certainly it does, you know. Um, but unfortunately, you know, um, the, the pressures that we find ourselves under aren't, aren't easy to solve. I mean, we all know about VDSL. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's yeah. hundred. You go to a rally, you know, and you hear people saying, "I've got this interference. I think it's to do with broadband and all the rest of it." VDSL, you know, um, and you know, every you get people coming at you from all sides, um, complaining about it, and we say, "Well, complain to Ofcom." Well, if you if you read the article back in May, um, Ofcom was saying they were getting about six complaints a year. Right, whereas we were getting, you know, a hundred at a radio rally, you know, some of the big yeah, rallies and yeah. stuff like that. So it didn't sort of balance up. So what we've done now is with the new software that Martin Sack, the chairman of the AMC, um, has developed, this Lantos software, it's now made it quite easy for, for for amateurs to, you know, take a sample of their of their own system and decide you know, and work out and, and convince themselves or show that it's actually VDSL that's causing the problem. But even though we've given people the tools, sadly, we're still not getting the numbers. We haven't reached 100 yet. Okay. We were hoping for 1,000. Well, yeah. I was hoping for 1,000. But that, that, again, you see, when I think back to years ago, before I was, you know, when I was just a DR, remember the, um, the free license? Well, maybe before you were you were licensed, but, but you know we used to have to pay for a license every year, right? And then Ofcom decided it was too much trouble. You know they didn't get the money anyway. Sorry, the RA decided it was too much trouble. They didn't get the money anyway, so they said, right, okay, your license is free. And oh, everybody says, great, fa fantastic, saves me fifteen pound a year. Right? But that you know you, you could argue that was the thin end of the wedge because. At least, you know, if you were paying a fee, you're paying a license fee, and you think you've, you've got more clout. If you're paying nothing, if they're giving it you for free, then, you know, they pay, perhaps yeah, pay lip yeah. service to it. You know? So, but again, with that, we went, the president at the time, Jeff Smith, and Peter Kirby, who was the general manager at the time, went around the country for weeks campaigning, you know, that we didn't have, you know, we, we didn't go for a free license. And I had visions of, of everybody writing a letter to Ofcom on this consultation, right? Um, and it going into Ofcom. And it, yeah, a lot, a lot of people did write, but out of 20, 25,000 members, about 40,000 licensed amateurs, there was 2,000 responses. Right, okay. Yeah. So the, the problem... The problem we've got with the hobby is that a lot of people think I've got the problem, but I'll let somebody else deal with it for me. You know? Yeah. Someone else has a problem I've as well it. and they'll deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's it. Yeah. I'll use the word apathy maybe. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Dave, we're going to open the floor to any questions that people might have or if folks want, you can message me and I'll ask if you're mic shy or anything like that. But before we do, as people are thinking of their questions, I'm going to fire off some quick fire to answer possible things, what have you, to see. Uh, so, uh, for example, Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Sunny holiday or city break? Sunny holiday. Yasu or Icom? Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Yasu, Icom, side by side. Oh, diplomat's answer, <laughs> diplomat's answer. Terry's orange or Cadbury's cream egg? Say again, sorry? Terry's orange or Cadbury's cream egg? Oh, Cadbury's cream egg. <laughs> uh, Indian takeaway or Chinese takeaway? Well, oh, that's 50 50. I can't, I can't, yeah. Depends <laughs> on the mood, that one, definitely. <laughs> and a day in the hills walking or a day at the beach? Or oh, a day at the beach. Yeah, you've seen what? the signs of me. <laughs> I, I, I don't do hills. You don't do hills, but do you not do a lot of camping, Dave? 
Oh yes, yeah, we do camping, yeah, yeah, yeah. but it's, it's 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 still not that oh, yet. Oh, oh. <laughs> no, that's right. no, no, I mean, uh, <laughs> right. Well, if, you really... I, if you can drive to the top of the hole, good. Yeah. That's it. Well, that's it. That's this, my this favorite. Now. This, this is really getting into the nitty gritty now because I don't know what was it you three years ago, um, we were on we, we were going camping, and um, daughter and her husband and granddaughter were coming to see us, okay? And they decided they were going to go up Snowden. Oh, I'll go up Snowden with you. Did I get up Snowden? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Although Snowden, you see, is another type of mountain that I like, but you can keep, take a train up Snowden <laughs> and take the train back. Brilliant. Uh, uh, yeah. I, there's a long-running joke around this region here with me, Dave. I like sodas, the ones that you can actually drive up to the top of, you know, and activate. Yeah. You don't have to walk up. You can just drive, put the handbrake on, and then drive back down. That's right. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, well, if anyone has any questions there, feel free, uh, ask away. I'd only ask that uh, you introduce yourself, first name and your call sign, so Dave knows who he's talking to. And uh, if uh, if it gets too much, then we'll have to raise a hand and, and we'll, 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 uh, we'll work it that way. But go ahead, anyone, if there are any questions there. Oh, Dave, hey. Go to all shout at once. Colin, I don't know if you're muted there, Colin G6MXL. Uh, you're talking there, but we're not hearing any audio. Any better? Oh, that's any it. better? That's Sorry it, about man. that. Right. Um, just a quick one to, to Dave. Um, oh, two questions, actually. One, um, is there any likelihood of the full license exam being done online, do you think? And secondly, once all this coronavirus has died down and it's sort of forgotten about, do you think that uh, online exams will con uh, online remote invigilated exams will continue, or will uh, things re revert to as they were? Right. Okay, Colin. Nice to see. I like the background. <laughs> <laughs> it's Iceland. <that. laughs> Iceland. All right. Okay. All right. Excellent. I've actually been to Iceland, yeah. Um, not on a radio trip, though. Right. Was it, will, will full um, exams be um, uh, going online? Uh, there's every possibility. Um, what I'm doing at the moment, I've been working with um, the candidates that have uh, that had their exams postponed or cancelled due to lockdown. There were about 10 or 12 of them. Uh, uh, under those circumstances so what we did a few weeks ago was we wrote to them asking um, if they'd be interested in taking part in a in a trial to see how the how the uh, the full exam work would work at, at uh, re with remote invigilation and I've been doing some work with those and, and unfortunately not all of the candidates uh, replied uh, there's there's only about four or five of them that reply and I'm part way through those now in fact I did one um, earlier in the week sorry no, last week and I've got another one later this week uh, I think it might even be to, I don't know, Thursday I think um, and then the others are towards the end of the month even though there's not much of the month left um, um, so but the main worry we've got is like uh, so that that the, the idea is to yeah to, to do it we want to do it but the worry we've got is the uh, is there a pent up demand, and we don't want to be you know uh, surprising ourselves. So what we what we're looking to do is to get ourselves nice and settled. Bear in mind we haven't done the intermediate exams that we announced um, in you know properly yet. They don't come in until the tenth of August. So even if we announce full was available today, the earliest a candidate could do it would be the middle of September. Right? But what we don't want to do is to have another big influx of candidates, or we need to be ready for it. So what we're looking to do is, you know, just manage it. So, yeah, the aim is to is keep, an, keep an eye on it, keep working on it, and, but the aim is to, do, to make online available. With regard to the future, um, I think it, it depends on candidates, depends on clubs. I mean, clubs... You know, once we get over the situation that we're currently in and whether that's this year or whether we have to wait until next year 
where you can do, you know, club uh, exams in the confines of a, of a of an exam room or a, a club room or something like that. And then we just have to wait and see, you know, and then then see. But you know, uh, online is available. Online is available, um, you know, all the time. So, so it's it's very it's, it's a, we're watching it. We're keeping an eye on it. You know, does that answer? Yeah, I think it does. And one other thought, um, let, let's sort of turn the clock forward a, a year for, for the sake of argument. And coronavirus, let's, again, for the sake of argument, saying it, that's sort of all done and dusted. Um, do you see the, the practical aspects of the courses coming back in? They might do, yes. <laughs> and the, the, I think that there's, there are issues, definitely. I mean, um, what we've noticed, uh, we've had comments coming back that whilst we've, we, for expedient reasons, we had to stop doing the you know, calling on candidates to complete the practical assessments at the foundation level. Um, what we have noticed is that number of uh, number of clubs and members are coming on and saying that you know some of some of the candidates, you know. Uh, are obviously lacking that sort of knowledge. And so what we always recommend when we, as, with the invigilators is we always say to them, make, to, make contact with your local club as and when you can and look to be doing the practical assessments. Go through them because it's very useful. Okay, by the time they've got onto the air, we all know that the first time you get on the air, it's, you know, sweaty palms and all the rest of it, isn't it? The second time, you know, it's not so sweaty. And the third time, it's like falling off a log, you know. Um, but we do say that, yes, there is a necessity for, you know, for, for those. You know, we, we do things. have the beyond exams. Dave, that some people say there's help. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's another help. initiative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Great, Thanks. great question. Great question. Anyone else, sir? Any questions there? Feel free to shout out. Well, that's good. The <laughs> <laughs> shy, Dave. When did you ever know people in Northern Ireland to be shy? <laughs> Dave, I don't know how you... I, I mentioned the Beyond Exams, and I think it is great. It's great, great initiative for clubs, and obviously clubs can't meet at the moment. And there's also the individual, which I think any new foundation candidate should do and experience. I'm going to start doing some of the aspects of it myself, because it is... It's, that divorce hobby, hobby, you'll never ever, never ever, yeah, every part of the hobby. That's I'm, just, right, yeah. I'm going to go back to one thing Dave asked you earlier is anything that ever sticks out in your mind? First of March 2013, 10 past three in the afternoon, out the back of tea time work, FT8800, and then our 770 in the car, and I worked on the National Space Station. I oh, was right. buzzing. I was buzzing for about three weeks. Imagine, after. Yeah. But it's one of them things in my life that I will never forget. Like somebody asked me, where were you when Elvis Presley died? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's, that's one of them things. And I, I just, you know, yeah. there's three things in the hobby like that. Day that just well, the thing is, I mean, keep going. But, but it, what I remember, I mean, with the ISS, for instance, I mean, we, we had a school up here uh, when Tim Peake was, was on board. We had a school up here, and I went along uh, to the to to the school there, uh, and it was it was fantastic to see the enthusiasm of the kids. You know, you see the videos, but when you're there in amongst them, and you can get that buzz and that you know that feel for for you know the fact of working working an astronaut, you know, like that, you know, it was actually great. I, I remember saying at that time uh, I was a regional manager. That thing. And I was hoping to get to that school in Manchester, as you know, yeah. nearby. I wasn't invited by ANSAP, but I just couldn't work it. Um, but I watched them all online. I said at that time it was one of the best initiatives and, and PR things for amateur radio. But I think the NHS thing has created that. Get on the air to care. Yeah. 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 Yeah, well, I mean, the, the numbers that, that you know, the, the way that, you know, amateur radio is being put in front of people now is just unbelievable, you know. Um, you know, the, the work that's been done with getting on the air to care and, and things like that, absolutely great. You know? uh, but the other thing is that um, talking about, you know, 
the you know newcomers into the hobby. The trick we've got, the trick we've got to try and pull off now, is to keep them in the hobby. What we don't want is people to go out and buy a thirty pound book song, be a beer fine, whatever, you know, work the work the local repeaters, and then get fed up with it. So what we really need to do is encourage them, and as you say, beyond exams, you know, does that that initiative gives them opportunities, gives them ideas to go for, you know, and things like that. You know. And and you know, say we're getting people coming in from from all walks of life because of get on the air to care and the like. Yeah. So. Yeah. Great. Great. So how many's on here tonight then? Did I, uh, did I frighten most of you off? <laughs> there would have been 22 because there's two people in the one QT gets there so we count that as two uh -huh. it's only 18 participants at the minute there's probably one or two has dropped off but right okay I, yeah. the top count would have been 22 dear. right no that's excellent yeah good stuff so no I mean I applaud you for doing this sort of thing it's really good you know and you've got a good programme going forward as well from the sound of it yeah yeah um, just to go back to the one Dave mentioned, I think in two weeks' time, the guy from the BBC that contacted the conference. Yeah, Laurie Margulis. Do, Laurie Margulis, do, you, want, yeah. do you want to elaborate a wee bit more on that? Was he not the gentleman that contacted 10 Downing Street and said the Falklands is being invaded? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> well, 1984. <laughs> 1982 or 83, 84, whatever. I wasn't born then. Um, but uh, he was the amateur, and the BB, his BBC producers had said to him, "You're one of those radio people. Uh, go up and see if you can make contact." And he did, uh, because the Argentines had invaded, they had knocked out all forms of communication back to the UK. So he was able to pick up the phone and uh, mention to the government, "Oh, by the way." <laughs> you've lost the Falklands uh, and then ten, <laughs> 10 minutes later the information he had given them had uh, all been passed on um, to the House of Commons and everything else so it, it's going to be a great evening and uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it myself you know um, and uh, what he has to say it's going to be another sort of interview style as well so yeah uh, see, that, see that's the other thing that there's all these stories that need to be captured aren't they? Because we're all of a certain age. Well, most of us, you're, you're a young whippersnapper, you is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if we're not careful, all these anecdotes, all these stories, you know, we can, we can end up losing them. So we need to capture them as much as we can. You know, I mean, I know around here in Stoke-on-Trent, they've got a particular accent. And years ago, they put a lot of effort into talking to the original potters you know, Stokies and the, and the like, uh, just to make sure that those accents were maintained. And we as a radio society need to be doing exactly the same. Some of the things that have gone on that we've been involved with, the amateurs have been involved with, we need to document them, you know. So. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, Dave, now's your chance to lobby the president before his tenure's up about why it's called RSGB and not RSUK. <laughs> 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 Steve, Don't get uh, me on that. <laughs> Steve, Steve, I'm not a political animal. <laughs> He's seen it before, Dave. Steve, Steve got bombarded uh, um, the other week. Now, so he did when he was on about uh, the, the name of the RSV. I wanted to petition a name change, you know, but uh, yeah, right. it's a long running joke. A long running. Joke. I, can imagine, I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. So I, I keep seeing a little note coming up. There's somebody's. Knackered because they haven't got a microphone or something. Oh, <laughs> Stuck, right. I think. Sorry, apologies for, apologies for the language. You see, I'm down to earth. You know, there's no, no airs and graces with me. You know, space or what's it. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions there? there? Some, a wee question here from Eric. Go ahead, Eric. Hello, Eric. Hey, Eric, GI0MSI. Hey, good evening there to you, Dave. Um, I'm just wondering there... Do you find many of the CBers uh, coming on from the CB world into the amateur world, or you know, to work different frequencies or whatever? Yeah. Or do you yeah. find it? Um, uh, you know, is it coming from the CB end of it, or or is it just coming straight into the amateur end of it? No, there's a mix. There's a total mix, but there are a lot of people coming from CB because people say to me on our courses, you know, 
I've come across I've come across to amateur from CB because there's nobody on on CB now and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. You know, um, where it is now with uh, in the situation we find ourselves now, I think it's probably not so many. You know, um, but I could be wrong because I, I must admit I, d- I don't ask the question if you've been on CB before. The question I usually ask is what got you into it, and and usually it's you know I've always wanted to do it. You know, uh, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there's some, you know, there's some excellent CB operators come across, you know. Uh, yeah, I, I do know that, uh, and I know a lot of CBs up in our country here they still operate on uh, DX in there because I was I was just listening there the other day, and it's it's unbelievable, like you know, just how active they are, you know. As opposed, yeah, yeah. it's like everything else is getting onto the different bonds and and that type of thing, you know. No, I was yeah. just wondering, I was just curious to know just. To, yeah, really what they've well. actually said, you know, I used to be a CB, and probably a lot of the amateurs way back in the eighties, <laughs> I would say, probably came from the CB end of it too, including myself, you know. That's right. If you, if you did a survey going backwards, yes, you'd, yeah, 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 very yeah. good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I I was never into CB. We we had CB in our house for about an hour, right? Uh-huh. We got all of a, I forget what the radio itself was. We got an Antron ninety nine, and I stuck it up on the chimney pot. Right, run the coax down to the radio. Um, I say I'm, I'm desperately trying to think what it was, but I can't. Um, and Kath transmitted on it. Well, at the time, uh, the youngest daughter was still living at home, and she was in the bedroom watching the TV. And as soon as Kath pressed the PTT, the TV went off. Yeah, and a scream yeah. from <laughs> scream from the daughter. <laughs> Telly's gone off. <laughs> I think everybody got the TV in them to us. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but that's before I knew anything about radio, and just stuck it in the you know the, the only spot that was available, right beside the TV area. You know. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now I would have put it a little bit further away. Only a little bit, not a lot. Give it, give it a bit of distance. That's right. <laughs> yeah, so it, so it went. It, you know, took me half a day to put it up, and took me about an hour to get it down. <laughs> yeah. Yank on the cable, and it was off, was it? <laughs> yeah. Oh dear, mate. Yeah, yeah uh, all I, these things. So. Dave, I used to hear stories about way back in the CB days. Uh, the the coax would have been run down the outside wall there into the. In through the window into the radio, and uh, somebody would came along at night and stuck the, the drawn pins into the coax. Yes, yeah. <laughs> to, put, to put them off the air. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. All those things. Yeah, we even thought about doing it. Was doing it ourselves. We had a going back to GB3 MP, the MP day, the notorious days of MP. There was a particular IQ zero um, that lived on the Wirral. He used to plague the, the repeater. Now, uh, before yeah, yeah. before before you confess to any crimes here of criminal damage, Dave, I must remind you we are recording this evening. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Dave, they've never they've never found his body. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, he has subsequently died, <laughs> but he wasn't us, honest. So, but no, he was, he was an absolute. He was a real pain in the backside. He was well to do. Um, he was a, a driving instructor, and I forget what he'd done before that, but he was retired, and he used to like a few cans at lunchtime so we used to come on the repeater about 11 o'clock and slowly as you went through the afternoon got more and more having a few more cans down his neck and but you know amateurs well we all know there's an on-off switch don't we on the radio and there's a vfo that you can turn to another frequency but you know when it was mp you know people would just goad this guy right he'd be saying right that's it i'm off now and all the rest of it. Now, people will be ignoring him, and they say, "Right, I'm going. You're all, you're all a load of turncoats, and all the rest of it. You're, you're heathens, and all this sort of thing. Abuse." And then somebody would just say something, and they'd be back, okay, for another hour and another can. Well, Kath and I decided, right, we'd had enough of this. Bear in mind that we knew he was on the wheel. We didn't know exactly where, so we spent a week. Of, I took a week's holiday. Kath wasn't working at the time. And um, we spent a week trying to track this guy down. And that was an interesting experience. You know, when you hear people say, all you need to do, just get, just get out there and DF them. Right? Oh, yes. Go out and try it. Try it sometime. Now, you know, it's not easy. Reflections and all the rest of it. And how many people have got directional aerials these days? Most people have got collinears, haven't they? That's not right. worth a carrot right. when it comes to trying to DF somebody. So, But we... 
we went looking for this guy and bear in mind he didn't come on all the time it was intermittent but we knew it was around about lunchtime or whatever but one particular day at the weekend we were getting close we knew roughly where he was basil his name was he called himself basil um and we knew where he was just just about and Kath was walking down the street and she <laughs> she'd got the scanner down her front right and we'd been walking up and down the street trying to work out where this signal was coming from and somebody from the local um, uh, community watch you know uh, crime watch accosted well walked up to Kath in the middle of the street asking well, what, what are you doing walking up and down you've been walking up and down for ages you know what are you doing and just as she walked as she said did, did that Basil's voice comes out of out of Cass blouse. <laughs> and she said, we're trying to catch this bar, this guy. Oh, dear. In the end, we, he, he did get caught. Um, and he, Basil, right? And this is where you've always got to take these things, you know, think, take the wider picture. He called himself Basil, and he lived in Baskerville Bloody Road, would you believe? <laughs> <laughs> Basil of Baskerville, very good. <laughs> That's right, yeah. So, but he was, um, he, he, he did get caught. Uh, he was reported to the, RA, to the RA of those days. And I don't, um, well, I better not say that next bit, but he, <laughs> en he ended up getting a license, right? Now, once he got a license, we were in trouble because you can't do much then, can you? you know, it's just bad operating, right? Um, but in the end, he had, we, we, we found out that he had a heart attack. He had a little um, pond in his garden he had a heart attack and fell into the pond. So, yeah. Oh, you really? Put, you really I, I thought that was going to be a good story, Dave. You really <laughs> put the dampers on that one now. <laughs> oh, no, it went, it went away, but it was nothing to do with us, thank goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that was sad, really, that it should end up, you know, we, di we didn't want that. You know. In the bottom and, of the pond. You know, and, and that's the other thing with this. I mean, Every cloud has a silver lining is the phrase, isn't it? You know, you think if we hadn't have had COVID, we'd still be bumbling along at what we were, right? Um, and it, it's really difficult for me sometimes to think that this success has come about, you know, and all those families out there who've lost... Well, our SGB started COVID then. Yes. <laughs> you heard it here first. We're having you now. Took the opportunity, right? Yeah. That's Is very good. A, an wee question here from the GI Zero MSI. Is there many still interested in CW, or is it um, oh, yeah. dying off? No, no. Did you you didn't see the thing on um, on the BBC News the other day? Um, no. There was a, there's a song in China that's been that's right, that's been, right, yes. That that has got in in it. A load of Morse giving some political message out. I spotted it on the, on the BBC News and sent it to Heather, and she circulated. She sent me a note today. Um, it she, was a, it was a children's game it had been developed for mobile phones for children in China, and the maker was an amateur, and he had put yeah. a political thing about Sweet. Hong Kong yeah. and Morse code in the back of a theme song of this children's app, which was swiftly taken off the air. But, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm just looking at the. Just give me a second. I'll just find the email from Heather. Uh, oh dear, where's it gone? It might take you a while because uh, you get a lot of emails sometimes through the RST. <laughs> <laughs> Can be uh, yeah, impossible. Yeah. But you're talking about there was a children's app. I didn't read the full story, but you know, good ploy because kids pick up Morse better yeah. than us older yeah. people do. And, and I think you were party to it, Dave, weren't you? I mentioned before up at the airwaves thing That's right. Morse, but the kids really took to the wee snail Morse keys we were making. Oh, well, they did, and, yeah. Yeah, those small yeah. keys. Yeah. Yeah, and there was a young girl there. Uh, they come up and I give her the crumb sheet and all and said, send your name and Morse. She just puts the crumb sheet back at me. She took the Morse key and she tapped it. Yeah, yeah. Like I never hear in my life. <laughs> That's right. Because she had an app on her phone. She had taught herself Morse code. Yeah. It was amazing. It just blew my mind. That's it. But uh, I always say in public events, if you want to attract young people to your stand, 
help out Morse. Yeah. You know, yeah. But the, 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 so uh, Eric Morse is still out there. Oh, very well. Just about, yeah. just about saying my call sign, my name on Morse, but that's, yeah. that's about it. When, with the, um, the, the 19, it was a uh, 100 year celebration for, for the first, first World War. We went out to Rill because the BBC put on a big travelling show, didn't they? I think it came to Ireland, didn't it? Yeah, we we done that too. Um, Ian, we did it in the Northern Ireland. And the Ian kids who's still on the call, I think, actually was there too and done quite a bit of the more yeah. stuff. And done, an, I done a, you know, the BBC approached me about a, about of uh, another view, and I says, "No, you want to go and talk to that man over there?" And he spoke very well about amateur radio. I have to say. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, you say there were, there was kids doing it and there was families doing it, you know, because there were kids were sending it to the parents, you know, and you know, the, the kids were getting it quast, faster than the, the parents were and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. But, they, you know, there the is still... still you know, I think the BBC more. borrowed the kit from the signals, but the Royal Signals, yeah, the, the right, yeah. or the team that... Yeah. So they approached Radio Amateurs and all the different locations. It was, it yeah. was a great event. Inspector, Inspector Morris used to always have the... the the CW, the Marsh going in the background of the... That's the right. Yeah, That's yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. so I, I'm weary of our time here because we're going on to half eight. Is there anyone... You're any, still trying to find that email. <laughs> yes. <laughs> any, any final questions there that we would have uh, for Dave? Hey, <clears throat> Dave, Jeff, uh, G-I-0-L-A-M. Oh, Jeff. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for your comments earlier. Very, very illuminating. Um, I'm, I'm often uh, accosted, as probably everybody else is, and yourself especially, uh, by people who say, why should I pay into the RSGB? What has the RSGB ever done for us, apart from the roads and the, everything else? But how, how do you answer it? Because I answer it as uh, at least the very minimum I think of it as is uh, like a union for radio amateurs. And uh, that's how I put it across. But how do you deal with that? In, in exactly the same way, because, you know, it, it, as you say, the strength of the union, get the strength of the union around you, and you can fight these things. If we as amateurs try, you know, try to uh, combat VDSL, try to combat this EMF consultation, right? Um, as, a, as a single voice, you've got very little chance of, of achieving any success. As a combined unit, then yes, you've got a much greater choice. And we do get involved. And we do have a great relationship. Being honest, we do have a great relationship with, with the guys at Ofcom. You know, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's building all the time and it's really good. So that's that. It's the strength to support and you know, protect what we've got, right, on behalf of radio amateurs, protect it, and also to try and push the boundaries further forward. Get more spectrum, you know, different yeah, people, modes, different challenges. People often say, you know, in, in response, and oh, well, I had a problem with this, and I went to the RSGB about it, and they told me to go to Ofcom, and I, I thought they should do it. They why why can't the RSGB do it? Um, I know the answer, and you know the answer, yeah. but uh, it's it's very difficult to explain to people that the RSGB is a voluntary organisation, and Ofcom is official them. And the other thing is uh, that when you tell people to go to Ofcom, because it's a government department, they don't really want to contact the government department. There's a, <laughs> there's a, there's a basic fear of authority, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah. Uh, I, I don't know how to deal with that. You, you can't really, can you? No, yeah, that's right. No. But again, it's, da it's all down to you know, individuals' <clears throat> expectations. You know, they all think, like I'm a repeater keeper. They all think I'm, when I take up an NOV for a repeater, I get issued with a baseball bat or something so I can beat people around the head. If know? only, if to only. Stop, <laughs> to stop the abuse. You know, people <laughs> think pins. because yeah. we're the RSGB, you know, I've got a problem with a neighbour, you know, <clears> we can solve it for him. You know, we're governed by rules and regulations just like everybody else. We can help. We can try and you know solve people's problems, but you know, don't, you know, not always are we success. We're not always successful, sadly. But again, it's down to expectations. I mean, in my first tenure, I've actually got a letter from Buckingham Palace. Now, no, it wasn't for an OBE or anything like that. No, it was from the patron, 
right, who'd been advised by the neighbour of a radio amateur, she was challenging the um, the appeal from the planning department, the local planning department, right? And in all honesty, she was she was right, because this guy, right, he lived in a uh, quite a nice part of London, right, and he wanted to put a step IR on his chimney pot, right? Yeah, you know how big step IRs are, mm. right? Put it on his chimney pot on a six foot pole, right? And he expected to be able to get that through planning department, and they refused it, you know. And she was, she, and, and then he challenged it, and she was fighting for it. And she actually wrote to the patron about it, you know. And I have to say that I was, I was on <laughs> it. Oops, should I, is it still being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> it's, it's, I say it's it's people's expectations. You know, I've got a license from the government. It allows me to. No, it doesn't. You will. You 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 can use it. You know, bounded by these rules and regulations. You know, and, and that's one of the problems we have with with IQ zeros. Right? People say it's bad language, but language you know doesn't come into the Wireless Telegraphy Act. Right? You know. Um, you know, that's one of the big problems. You go down, walk down the street, and what sort of language do you hear these days? You know, you wouldn't want. Do you ever hear the story about the court case in the northeast? Oh yes, yeah. About the broad, brought it to court and all, and blah blah blah, and the judge says, "Hold on, that language is second nature here. Yeah. It's thrown out of court." That's right. Yeah. An official from Ofcom told me that. They spent a fortune bringing this to the court. Cost, cost about and, uh, and judge threw it out because it was everyday language. Yeah, yeah. You know. You know. Dave, I, I must say, uh, sorry, uh, unless anyone has a final, final, final burning question. George, GI4SJQ, thank, <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your time this evening, Dave. Um, quick question you mentioned earlier on that there's uh, up to 25 invigilators and um, that that's being from an education background and uh, knowing what goes on with online exams that's for the number of exams that uh, you, you've held on over the time period that you've run them that that's a heck of a lot of work if someone either watching this now or watching it on youtube later wanted to become or get involved in uh, in the invigilation, the online invigilation, you know, what do they need? What do they, what do they do? Who do they contact? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question, George. If people, if people want to offer, you know, to volunteer, then simply drop me an email, right? EQAM at rsgb.org.uk. EQAM. Right. Um, what do they need to do? Well, it's it's very well. Dave's the best one to tell you because he is one. <laughs> you pay <laughs> ten pound to me, and ten pound to Dave Wilson, and that get no. <laughs> Essentially, the way the, the way the system works, what what the candidate, what the vigilator needs to do is to carry out a call with the um, with the candidate about three or four, maybe five days before that exam, to test the technology, right? Because a you've got the online system which many people haven't seen, you know, used before. Um, but in truth, it's very, very simple to use. And then you've got the video conferencing. More and more people are getting used to video conferencing. But some, some use Zoom, some use WebEx, some use Teams, some use Skype. They're all the same, but they're all different, if you understand me. So there's a, there's a quick call, and it only takes about 10 minutes, to, to put candidates' minds at ease as to how the thing's going to work. You know, make sure you get the WebEx working so you can hear and see each other. Make sure you've done the tutorial with the with the uh, test reach system. And then once that's done, then it's a matter of then um, setting up another call a few minutes before starting, a few minutes before the exam time, and um, and and simply watching the candidate in, in simple terms. And it's amazing the views that you get. Of, uh, of candidates you'll see so many different mannerisms it's really entertaining at times there was one guy every question i can remember this guy one every question he'd read it and he'd sit there like that 
for about 30 seconds, 45 seconds, and then he'd go and put the answer. And then he'd read it. And <laughs> it was like it was like a machine going around. But no, I mean, it's, it's just devoting a little bit of time. So there's, there's a 10 minute call a few days beforehand. And then there's whatever the duration of the exam is. Foundations an hour, intermediates an hour and a half um, for that. And we, we try to encourage, uh, as you say, we've, we've got all these exams. We've only got 25 invigilators. We try to encourage invigilators to take multiple candidates. And it works extremely well. You know, um, it's now limited to three, but we've had four on the screen. You can have four candidates on the screen. And it's, it's amazing. You're watching the whites of their eyes. They can't, they can't move away you know, without, do, without you spotting them, if you do the job properly. And that's the other thing that um, we talk about. From my perspective, as the quality manager and inspections, right, as of the 10th of April, every exam is being inspected because these invigilators have got no relationship with any of the candidates, right? So there's no vested interest in any of them. They're doing it right, okay? So to my mind, that means every candidate is being inspected. So my quality report, when I report to the, to the standards committee next year, whereas I'm saying, what well, I've just said this year, is we're struggling to get over, you know, to anywhere near the 10%, I'll be able to say we're, all, we're almost at 100%, right, using online invigilation. Yeah, because there's no, there's no, there's no interest. You, Dave, you know, you, you build up a, a relationship, but for it's only for a short time. But whether the candidate passes or fails, that's purely down to the candidate. There's no way that Dave can help. You know, that's very it. much so. Very much so. Unless they offer fifty quid, and it no more <laughs> uh, So, Dave, listen. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been great having you along. And oh, uh, thank you you'll be able to watch yourself and think, did it really say that? Did it really pick no, no. over Pepper? That's, that's no. what uh, and that's about what a, <laughs> in about a couple of days time on our YouTube channel. So uh, again, thanks folks. And uh, if you're watching this as well on YouTube, check us out and join us next week for our Tuesday night lecture series. So Dave, thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks, everybody.